I can make that. This is the video I've wanted to make for a long time. And while most of my videos are step-by-step -step tutorials, this one is about workflow. I want to show you how I made this. I want to show you the process. My approach, the challenges, the struggles, and mistakes I made along the way. Because I made a lot of them. And that's okay. I do want to thank the people at Capturing Reality for sponsoring this video and for making this kind of project possible. It all started with wanting to create a cool environment in Unreal Engine 5. Every artist has been there. You can try to think of something to make for months and never end up excited enough to go through with it. But when inspiration strikes you, you gotta see that fleeting, ephemeral moment. So I took off from Oslo to Northern Norway in the Arctic Circle, which is possibly the most majestic place I've ever been to. I mean, look at this place. Now, why on God's green earth would I book a flight and go all the way up there? Photogrammetry. I wanted to use 3D scanning to capture and create something truly unique, something iconic in the area. And nothing screams Lofoten more than Rorbu, which are traditional fishing cabins perched right up alongside the coast, literally hanging over the water. They look awesome. And here began a series of challenges I didn't totally think through. What I forgot was, in order to get a 3D scan of such a fishing cabin like this, I need to take photos of them from all angles. But since they're perched over the water, I don't have a boat. And I'm not allowed to fly a drone here. Unfortunately, the weather was also absolutely fantastic. Beautiful sunshine, clear blue skies for days, which means it's terrible for photogrammetry. Because when you're scanning large objects like buildings, overcast days become necessary, or at least very helpful, to get that sweet, soft light, soft shadows, and avoiding harsh, specular highlights. The reason we need overcast days is because whatever lighting is in our photos will get baked into the texture of our 3D model later. Overcast days are perfect because that kind of lighting is flat and diffused, which makes it a lot easier to relight it in 3D. And when the entire purpose of a trip like this revolves around photogrammetry, yeah, that was a bummer. So I tried scanning at dusk when the sun had gone behind the mountains, but two more problems arose here. One, this time of year, it gets dark very quickly. Secondly, the cabin I was trying to scan had extremely little in the way of feature points. The smooth, even shiny paint job meant the scan did not turn out very well at all. To make matters worse, I kind of forgot to bring my polarizing filter, which would effectively cut out the shininess of the red paint. But even then, I'm not sure that would have helped because A, it was already too dark and a filter would have made it even darker, and B, there still weren't enough feature points on the walls. So I had to find something else to scan since I did not have very much time up here. But after a few miserable, gorgeous, sunny days, I was there for about six days and I was blessed with one morning of overcast goodness. So I settled to scan something I knew for a fact would turn out well. This old wooden cabin from the 1800s with no shiny paint and a lovely grass roof. I wanted a red cabin because that's pretty iconic. But most of the red ones have a very shiny red paint. And anyone who's done photogrammetry before knows shiny surfaces are always a bit trickier to scan. Reflections will affect the alignment and final quality of your scan. So unless you're using a polarized or even a cross-polarized setup, we try to avoid it. That is why I opted to scan this bare wood cabinet instead. Because I knew the scan would turn out much better. And since I had such limited time, I wanted to be sure that I go home with at least one usable scan. I knew I could make it red later in the texturing phase. Now, the process of photogrammetry is often more or less the same. Take as many photos of every angle as you can and hope for the best. Ensure a constant exposure, lock your white balance, shoot raw photos, not JPEG. For this cabin, I took about 1,000 photos, and I looked completely ridiculous while taking them. It's a good workout, though. 
What's tricky about shooting on location like this is unless you have a beefy laptop or a portable workstation, you kind of just need to pray that the data set and the photos you took are good enough because there's no way to make sure the scan turned out well until you get home and it's too late to make corrections. So the stakes are high. If you want to try 3D scanning for yourself, I've made a few dedicated tutorials where I hold your hand every step of the way, like how I scanned this old building in depth. You'll find a link down below along with all the other tutorials I mentioned, videos you might find useful to follow along with this video. Now, I know what you're thinking. How in the world is a grass roof going to scan well? It won't. If your subject moves even a tiny little bit, a little bit of wind in there, it can mess up your scan, but that's okay because I knew that I would remove it when I get home and use the foliage tools in Unreal Engine to get a much better result. But more on that soon. Now, another mistake I made is wildly underestimating the amount of SD cards I would need. You see, I'm used to shooting with my Nikon Z6 II, which has a 24 megapixel sensor. But this time around, I was shooting with my D800, which has 36 megapixels, which is 50% higher resolution, which is great for photogrammetry. But that's also 50% more storage requirements than I thought I needed. And being in a very small town in a remote part of the world, I couldn't simply just go to the store and buy more. I had to make do with what I had. I had four 64 gigabyte SD cards and I filled those up real fast given how many subjects I tried to scan here. Honestly, total rookie mistake, but hey, it happens to the best of us. So after getting home, I've got the data set, the photos taken, let's take a look at whether I got something good enough or if this trip was a total colossal waste of time. So using Photo Mechanic, which is a photo ingesting and management tool, I can very quickly sort through all of the photos taken and delete the photos that are blurry, too noisy, or overall not sharp enough to be considered. There is zero point in using blurry photos. It's just going to cost you more money for nothing when you're using Reality Capture, and those photos will not improve your scan. I could do all this directly in Adobe Lightroom, but Photo Mechanic is way faster for going through a bunch of photos quickly. It is literally plug and play. You don't need to import anything like you have to do in Lightroom. But with the photos culled and I deleted the ones I don't want, then I bring them into Lightroom for some minor tweaking. Reducing those highlights, lifting up those shadows, very, very subtle local sharpening, ensuring the white balance is even across the board. Apply those corrections to all of the images using the sync feature then export them as JPEGs. And then we can bring those JPEGs into Reality Capture by simply drag and dropping the files into your viewport. And as you can see, we've got nearly 1000 images. Then we can align the images and soon enough, we'll get a preview of our scan with the point cloud and we can see all of the aligned photos right here. Lo and behold, it seems pretty good. I can't complain. And now it's time to process the 3D mesh. I'll use a normal reconstruction for now, and this can take a while depending on your PC. It's very CPU intensive and CUDA core intensive. So if your PC is a potato, just be prepared to wait a while. And after waiting, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. The grass roof evidently needs a little bit of cleanup, which I can fix directly in Reality Capture using the filtering tools. You can do this in ZBrush or Blender as well and re-import the cleaned mesh. Remember, I don't need the roof to be absolutely perfectly clean because we're going to be covering it all up with foliage in Unreal Engine later anyway, but I'm going to take some time to clean up the base here because I don't want this to give me any headaches later as I try to integrate this cabin into the landscape I'll be making in Unreal. Now, the last step of the process, generating the UVs and the texture of our model here by clicking right here. And again, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. This is exactly what I wanted. Now, before we continue, I want to address a question I get a lot when I make this kind of model. Why bother with photogrammetry? Why not just make the 3D model from scratch in Maya, Blender, ZBrush, whatever? Why go all the way out on location, spend time taking photos and processing this data? And that is a very valid question. I've been a 3D modeler for most of my career as a 3D artist. I absolutely could model the simple cabin by hand. I could easily texture it myself from scratch too. 
But getting this level of fidelity in a 3D model is not only extremely time consuming, but in all likelihood, you will not get the same variation and convincingness of the wear and tear, the small detail that you just don't normally think about. It's always going to feel a little bit CG. There will always be something that feels artificial. When I made this previous project, I had a few people telling me that they can do the same thing in one day from scratch and that I wasted my time. No, you can't. Not at this level of fidelity with 16 4K texture sets. Not gonna happen. It would take a senior modeler the better part of a week to model and UV all this, at least two days of sculpting all the parts and pieces, whereas it took me less than a day's work to take the photos and generate the model in reality capture. Plus, photogrammetry is a fantastic excuse to get my butt outdoors and seeing the world. You get a gorgeous 3D model, lovely textures, you save a ton of time, you get to travel, it's a win-win. But not just that. There is a certain satisfaction in capturing and immortalizing historic structures like this, preserving history in a way. You know you're getting the real deal. There is so much personality and character in the texture of the wood here, the wear and tear, everything you see here is authentic and legit. It's extremely difficult even for a senior texture artist to really nail that kind of character in the weathering of the wood. There's no tiling, no repetition, every plank of wood is different and has its own story to tell. Now, when it comes to exporting your model, you'll need what we call PPI credits. Reality Capture is free to use, but to export your model, you are charged on a per megapixel basis. It is very affordable though, and you can use the PPI calculator right here, link down below, to figure out how much a model will cost you beforehand. This cabin right here would have cost me about $20 to export. Or it would cost $10 if you use the discount code William50 to get 50% off your next purchase of 3,500 PPI credits. Now we can export the model and the textures out of Reality Capture and into Unreal Engine 5. We'll set up the material by bringing in the textures and begin the fun part, blocking out our scene and start the beginning stages of our composition. So when you're creating environments and worlds, it is super important to gather reference and not just make something based on memory. Reference is key. So taking a look here at PRF, I've got a whole bunch of images that I gathered. My own photos I've taken when I was up there many times over the years, gather reference. And thanks to Megascans, blocking something out is really easy and quick. We just want to start establishing the rough layout. No need to dive into the detail just yet. Placing rocks and establishing the lay of the land. Now, I already had these mountain meshes from an earlier project, but again, these are just placeholders until I make some proper mountains soon, which we will get into shortly. Now, because the ocean is a pretty substantial part of this environment, as Lofoten is a coastal region and everything revolves around the sea, I needed to make sure that we get that cold Nordic oceany vibe. And for the ocean, I'm using a heavily modified version of the Ocean Systems plugin made by the talented Dylan Brown. So I gotta give credit where credit is due. I did not make the ocean shader from scratch, but what I did do is I made some pretty substantial changes to the shader to give it the look I wanted to get some of that translucency, which you don't normally get with the plugin out of the box. Now, this plugin is intended for use with the movie Render Queue, which we will get into later in the rendering phase of this process. It isn't intended for real-time use. As you're gonna see right here, it is heavy, very slow. So I just use the play mode to get a better feel for how things are going to look, but in editor mode, I tone it down a little to keep my frame rate up. Now, pro tip for anyone, you need to make sure you establish your camera angles early on. This helps you focus your attention on what matters. I knew I wanted to recreate a drone type of shot with the camera looking down and slowly rotating up for a panoramic reveal. It's important to place your camera as early as possible because it will help you focus your attention only on what matters. If a part of your environment is not visible in the camera shot, don't bother wasting your time on it. Only focus on what the camera can see. So you'll see, I'm really just kit bashing these mountains and rock formations in place. 
I think I'm only using something like three or four rock models and scaling and stretching and rotating them to break up that repetition. We can even match the color of the different rocks using the default mega scan material easily to make them feel a bit more cohesive, like they belong together in the same place. Otherwise, you're gonna get color discrepancies like this by default, and it just looks wrong. It looks like the rocks are just totally mismatched. Now, you might be wondering about the lighting. How am I getting these clouds? How am I getting this really cool looking sky? And truth is, exterior lighting is possibly the easiest form of lighting there is. There are two light sources, the sun and the sky. It can't be more bare bones than that. But it's the clouds that are trickier to get right. And for this, I almost always use a plugin called Ultra Dynamic Sky or UDS for short. It's pretty much the most commonly used plugin for exterior lighting. And the reason is because it's just so easy to use. It makes art directing your clouds a real breeze, no pun intended. I needed this to sell the sense of scale in the mountains I have, which is when the peaks of the mountains are hidden by the clouds. You can do that with this plugin. It totally makes the shot. Without it, it's just not the same. You don't get that same stormy vibe. But now, because the rocks are a brownish gray, the cabin is also a brownish gray, the lighting is a bit warm, the shot is starting to feel a little monochromatic. Like I said earlier, I really wanted the cabin to be red, not only because the red will make the cabin pop out from the rest, but also because it is an iconic part of the Norwegian landscape. So heading over to Substance Painter, let's make our cabin red. Now, I don't wanna just make the whole thing red and call it a day. My goal here is to preserve some of the character of the wood grain, preserve that beautifully aged weathering that can only be replicated over literal centuries of exposure to the rough Norwegian sea. So I'm using an albedo map at the base here as a kind of mask of sorts to make the paint feel weathered, chipped, flaky, and worn out over the years. It's literally as simple as that. Using the luminosity of the albedo map allows me to get a really cool placement of the red paint, almost procedurally in Subton Painter. I did have to manually mask out some areas where I didn't want there to be red paint, like on the beams and the corners and on the window frames here. So there was a little bit of manual painting involved. Now, I just need to set the roughness value of the new paint, export these textures, and back in Unreal Engine, assign that new texture to the cabin, and now we have red. It makes a pretty big difference. The cabin stands out a little bit more from the rest, and make the whole shot a little bit more interesting. So once you're happy with the rough composition of your shot, you can start refining things and replacing the placeholders with the real stuff. Which brings me to how I made these mountains. I have used many landscape or mountain creation tools throughout my career, world machine, world creator, but my favorite for years has been Gaia. It has its quirks and weirdness, but it produces the best looking erosion and is, in my opinion, the easiest to use. With just a few nodes, you can get some pretty convincing looking mountains and export those into Unreal Engine. My own node graph that I used here is a little bit more convoluted, but it's all pretty easy to learn once you wrap your head around what the nodes do. To be clear, I'm not sponsored by Gaia. I'm not being paid to say this. I bought my Gaia license with my own money I'm just a big fan of this tool and I wholeheartedly recommend it. Now, because Unreal Engine 5 has a feature called Nanite, which is what allows Unreal to handle models with millions of triangles without any hiccups, I wanted to put that to good use. So rather than export a height map from Gaia and use the landscape tools in Unreal, I generated the landscape in 8K, exported an extremely high resolution mesh directly out of Gaia, sitting at around 70 plus million polygons, and to be fair, I did use ZBrush to decimate that model using Decimation Master and bring that poly count level down to a more reasonable level, down to about 7 million polys. Decimation Master is kind of black magic when it comes to preserving detail and dropping poly counts. From there, I bring the mountains into Blender to smooth the faces. Since ZBrush exports non-smooth normals, we need this because Nanite performs much better if your mesh normals are smooth. From Blender, we can export it directly into Unreal, as is. When you import it, be sure Nanite is enabled, and as a result, 
the mountains end up looking pretty spectacular, rich in crisp detail and fully textured thanks to Gaia's texturing tools. You can export masks for every kind of node here to get very interesting patterns to help with texturing or making your own materials in Unreal using Megascan surfaces. This is one of the many reasons I adore working with Gaia. It's just really easy to work with. So placing these mountains is really just a matter of finding an angle, placing them in such a way that they catch the ambient lighting in a way that looks good. So with these rocks and the roof of the cabin feeling a little bit boring right now, it's time to dress up the land with some foliage. The Megascans library has a ton of foliage to choose from. It's just a matter of finding the ones that look good for your scene. And from there, just paint away. Looking at the reference I have here, it's got a hearty mix of grass, dead weeds, and larger bushes of sorts. So that's what I intend to do. I just select my roof here, find the foliage that I want, and literally just paint it all across that roof and it looks great. Now, coastal areas in Norway always have a ton of seaweed along the shore at low tide, so I wanted to add that in too in order to really capture the vibe of the place. And now we're starting to get a shot that looks pretty cool. It always kind of blows my mind how a simple thing like foliage can make a barren scene suddenly look awesome. And really, that's pretty much it when it comes to creating a scene. But I have two other shots that I made, right? This one and this one. It really is just a matter of creating a new sequence, placing a new camera, and choosing the shot length. In this case, I went with 240 frames for a total of 10 seconds of footage at 24 FPS. I opted for a different focal length this time, 85 millimeters and 50 millimeters respectively. The scene in the additional shot did need a little bit of extra love, placing additional rocks, adding more detail with decals and foliage to really make the other two shots shine because the camera in these shots is much closer at these angles. You'll notice at some point I've also added a few fog cards in there just to kind of help occlude the horizon of the ocean just a little bit just to break up that straight harsh line. It's really just a texture of a cloud that I put on a plane and placed it at the correct distance. It's really as simple as that. There's nothing fancy going on there. So one last thing I like to do is add some final touches to breathe a little bit of life into my scene. Things like camera shake, which I cover in this tutorial here, adding things like birds. These shots really just wouldn't feel right without them. And lastly, adding a bit of wind to the foliage, which can be done directly in the Megascan material of the foliage itself. And now with our shots done, we move on to the rendering and the color grading phase, which is really where all of your shots come to life. You're only halfway done when you're finished in Unreal, trust me. This is the most important part of the process, rendering and color grading. So I'm gonna render these out at max quality using the movie render queue. Here, we can determine the resolution we want, the console variables we want, and the anti-aliasing settings, which will absolutely give us some top-notch looking renders. Now here are my settings, but don't worry, I have an in-depth updated version of my movie render queue guide coming soon, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. Always render in 16-bit EXR to get the most dynamic range, which gives us the most flexibility in post. In color output, be sure to disable the tone curve. Under anti-aliasing, override anti-aliasing should be checked, Set AA method to none, and usually 16 temporal samples is good enough. Having 32 or more samples is not necessarily going to make your renders better, they'll just take two or four times longer to render. So try to keep that number as low as you need. I've rendered shots with eight temporal samples and it was fine, but 16 is a good middle ground. In console variables, I add the following commands. I'm also going to disable bloom in my post-process volume for reasons you're going to see soon. And in output is where I determine my desired resolution. And in this case, I want 4K. So now moving over to the color grading part of the process, this is quite possibly the most satisfying part of this entire process. Color grading our renders to add the final touch to our images. This is the part where you make your renders pop, giving them the extra oomph they deserve, that magic sauce. I cannot stress enough how important 
this part is. And to do that, I'm going to go into DaVinci Resolve, which is free to use. Importing my renders here, switching my project setting to ACES CCT, ACES 1.2, and the output to Rec. 709. This approach entirely depends on your project and personal preferences, but this is what I like to do. I talk about it more in depth in this video right here. Then by right clicking on a clip, assign the input color space to linear sRGB and laying them out on the timeline, we're ready to grade these shots. Moving over here to the color page, I usually start off with a few curve adjustments, color temperature shift, and then adding things like glow, which is the equivalent of bloom in Unreal, which we disabled earlier, right? I tend to disable bloom when rendering out of Unreal because bloom sometimes introduces a lot of flickering artifacts in your renders, and I prefer to have more control over the look of it myself in post. Plus, I feel like Unreal's own bloom settings tend to be a dead giveaway, give the renders a typical Unreal look, which I don't like. Then I can go ahead and add some local adjustments, add film grain, chromatic aberration, halation, and a few other effects to really fine tune the way things look. There are no magical settings when it comes to color grading. Don't bother trying to copy mine because it's all entirely dependent on your shots. My settings might not look good on your renders, and it's also entirely subjective and up to your own personal taste. I just want to show you my rough approach, so use this as a rough guideline instead. So that is how I created all of these shots. There is no black magic or any rocket science involved. Anything I did here is perfectly doable by any of you. You'll find more dedicated step-by-step -step tutorials to everything I've done here from photogrammetry, lighting, rendering, color grading in the description below. So you've got everything you need to get started with creating your own worlds. I hope you found this video helpful. And if you did, do leave a comment down below if this is the kind of thing you would like to see more of. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, happy rendering.